Welcome to the Trip Hacks DC podcast. Discover the best tips, tricks, and travel hacks for your visit to the nation's capital. And now, here's Rob. Hello, and thank you for tuning in. If you want to check out any show notes from this episode, listen to other episodes, or learn about Trip Hacks DC guided tours, you can do all of that over at TripHacksDC.com. If you're new to this podcast, or Trip Hacks DC in general, hello, my name is Rob. I'm a tour guide, and I founded Trip Hacks DC back in 2017. My goal is to give you my best tips, tricks, and travel hacks so you can have the best possible trip when you visit Washington, D.C. This episode is actually not about Washington, D.C. in the literal sense. It's about the places you can go on day trips when you venture over here. I think this is an important topic because I think day trips can be great in some cases, but I also think they can easily derail a trip if you aren't careful. It's also a topic people ask me about quite a bit. My definition of a day trip is someplace that you travel to, spend time there, and then return to your original origin all in the same day. So basically, you travel first to location A, you have your hotel in location A, then one day you travel to location B, spend some time there, and by the end of the day, travel back to your hotel in location A. If you spend the night somewhere, that's not a day trip. A day trip to me is literally a place you go and return all in the same day. So why are day trips appealing to travelers and tourists? I think it's because people want to get a good value when they travel. They want to have a good bang for their buck. If they're going to spend a lot of money on airfare and a lot of time traveling a long distance, it's only fair to want to experience a lot of different things and a lot of different places. The temptation is, well, since I'm already in the vicinity of all these different places, I ought to go. And I get it. When I was a younger traveler, I definitely felt these temptations too. But I say this as someone who gives Washington, D.C. travel tips and as someone who has made plenty of travel mistakes myself. It's almost never worth it to spread yourself too thin on a trip. Even if you visit a lot of really great places, even if you check off a lot of places from a list, if you barely have any time to spend in or experience those places, it winds up not being a great experience. Yeah, you can say you went, but so what? I think most travelers realize that the whole point of all of this is for quality experiences, not checking things off of a list. I also want to say that what I'm going to cover in this episode applies specifically to Washington, D.C. tourists or visitors. Day trips are a different calculation if you live here. Some of the places I'm going to mention in this episode as bad day trips might actually be okay if you live here. Just want to make sure that's clear up front. What I've done for this episode is round up seven places that I think make for good day trips from D.C. and four places I think are tempting day trips but that you should not day trip to. Obviously, I've limited this to places that are physically and realistically possible to do as day trips. And yes, I know, it's possible to get on a plane at 6 a.m., fly to Chicago, and fly back that night. But to me, that's not a realistic day trip, so things like that aren't on the list. I also want to talk about my overall approach to day trips, which is that the number of them you take should depend on the number of nights you're going to spend in D.C., Generally speaking, I think, if you're spending three or fewer nights in D.C., don't take any day trips. If you're spending four to six nights in D.C., up to one day trip. And if you're spending seven or more nights in D.C., up to two day trips. The reason I've come up with this is because if you're traveling into D.C., spending five nights here and taking four day trips, then you basically only have one day left for D.C., and that's not nearly enough. Washington, D.C. is much bigger tourism-wise than a lot of people give it credit for. It's the reason why I don't recommend people take day trips to D.C. from other places on the East Coast. You need a proper amount of time here to experience things. Only if you've given yourself a lot of extra buffer should day trips be in the consideration. Okay, so with all of that said, let's start with the first day trip that I like and recommend, and that's Old Town Alexandria. Now you might be asking, is Alexandria really a day trip? It's a suburb of Washington, D.C., and that's basically true. Old Town is about eight miles from D.C., 
it's closer to downtown than two out of our three airports are. In some ways, Old Town is kind of just like another neighborhood. But to me, Old Town is just far enough away from D.C. that it's not a place I think about or go to all the time. It's also more than just a neighborhood in the sense that there are a lot of things to do there, and you can spend a good chunk of your day exploring it if you want to. I also think Old Town is similar but has its own unique culture that makes it distinct from D.C. I actually made a video about visiting Old Town that I will link to in the show notes if this is one you want to do. By the way, did you know that Trip Hacks DC is also a YouTube channel? I used to assume that everyone knew, but I've been meeting more and more people lately who listen to this podcast but have no idea I also make videos. I've got one about Old Town, plus a ton of other topics, so check out the show notes if you're interested. Anyway... What I like most about Old Town is that it has a certain charm that's hard to describe, but you know it when you experience it. Old Town is roughly defined as the area around King Street, between the Potomac River, or the waterfront, and the King Street Metro Station. The distance between the waterfront and Metro Station is about one mile, and if you walk between the two, that's called walking the King Street Mile. I actually think this is the best possible introduction to the area. Walking the mile gives you a quick sense of the vibes and what the area has to offer. Old Town is kind of similar to the Washington, D.C. neighborhood Georgetown in the sense that they are both old, historic port neighborhoods. You can see classic row houses, there's a main street with lots of boutique shopping and dining, and lots of places to eat and drink. According to Visit Alexandria, there are over 100 boutique stores along the King Street Mile. I don't know exactly how accurate that is, but it definitely feels like there are that many. And a little side tip, no pun intended, is occasionally leave King Street and go check out some of the side streets around it. There's a lot of cool stuff that's not necessarily right on the main drag. If you visit Old Town when the weather is nice, a lot of the restaurants on the waterfront set up outdoor dining so you can eat near the water. If you're a fan of ships or naval history, you can tour the tall ship Providence. Providence is a reproduction of the first ship authorized to serve the Continental Navy, so its history goes way back. Nearby to the waterfront is the Torpedo Factory Arts Center. This was a munitions plant during the World Wars, but the building is now studio space for artists and galleries. You can watch artists at work, attend art talks, and purchase original artwork. I'm not a huge art person, but even I think the space is pretty cool and definitely unique. Some of the art that's in my own home came from the Torpedo Art Factory. Old Town does have a few museums, and even though they're not as famous as the museums in D.C., they can be pretty cool and are usually much less crowded. A few of the museums you can look up include Gadsby's Tavern Museum, the National Inventors Hall of Fame Museum, and the Alexandria Black History Museum. I will link to all of those in the show notes. One thing about me is that I'm not just a tour guide, but also a huge connoisseur of tours. Last summer, on my day off, I signed up for the Blue Fern Old Town Food Tour, and it was an awesome experience. The way they structure their food tour is to replicate a meal. So you start with a cup of coffee, then go and get an appetizer, then a main course, and end the tour with dessert. The cool thing about food tours or at least good food tours, is that it's not just about the food. This one had a lot of great history about the neighborhood as well. I personally will say that one reason there are no Trip Hacks DC food tours is because they are very difficult to execute. So when I take one that is well executed, I have great respect for the company. I'll drop a link to the exact tour I took in the show notes. Okay, So if you want a day trip to Old Town, the good news is there are lots of ways to get there. The best way for most tourists is to take Metro. You can either use the blue or yellow line to get to King Street. It's cheap and efficient, but if you want to elevate the experience, you can use the water taxi. Now I have to warn you that water taxi is probably the most fun way to get to Old Town, but if Metro is cheap and efficient, water taxi is kind of the opposite. Unfortunately, during the COVID years, Water Taxi was acquired by a giant tourism conglomerate. They raised prices and operate Water Taxi more like a tourist attraction than actual useful transportation. 
to me, it's similar to the cable car in San Francisco. Yes, technically it's transportation, but in practice, it's almost exclusively used by tourists joyriding around. Water Taxi is also not a year-round operation. They close in December for the winter months and reopen in the spring. That's low season for tourism in D.C., which I think further shows that Water Taxi is for tourists rather than locals. In any case, if you're okay spending the money, it's a fun way to go. Another fun way to go is on a bike. You can take the Mount Vernon Trail, which runs almost entirely in the George Washington Parkway, basically from the Lincoln Memorial all the way to Old Town. And I know for some people, this isn't a practical option, maybe because you're traveling with kids, or you're not physically able, or you're coming in July and the heat is too much. That's all okay. But if you're into biking, it's a fun way to go. And you can always bike to Old Town and take Metro back. You can even do this ride on a Capital Bike Share bike, which makes the whole experience pretty seamless. So that's Old Town. Day trip number two that I like is Mount Vernon, George Washington's home. Mount Vernon is about 16 miles from downtown, or about twice as far as Old Town. One thing that makes Mount Vernon different from many of the historic sites in Washington, D.C. is it's not part of the federal government. It's a private estate operated by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Most importantly for you as a visitor, that means that it is not free. You do need to purchase tickets to go. There are tickets that are general grounds admission, and then there are add-ons for various tours that you can do. One of the benefits of being a private historical site is that it's pretty well maintained, and the programming is pretty good. It's also, I think, the only site that is open every single day of the year, including on Christmas. Of course, if you're planning to go on Christmas or a holiday like the 4th of July or any other peak date, make sure to plan ahead and get your tickets in advance. I personally think George Washington was a fascinating person. Most Americans, if asked to describe George Washington in one sentence, would say he was America's first president. And that's true, but it's fascinating because he's really the only president who never wanted the job. And of course, he did a whole lot more as a founding father than simply serve as president. Mount Vernon is open 9 to 5 most months of the year and 9 to 4 in the winter months. When you visit the estate, you can see the mansion, gardens, the farm, and George Washington's final resting place. When you tour the U.S. Capitol, you'll see the original tomb that Congress built for George Washington, but ultimately he wanted to be buried at his home and not in the Capitol, so this is where he is. If you get hungry, there's a food court with some basic options and maybe a good choice if you're traveling with kids. If you want a more elevated experience, there's also the Mount Vernon Inn, which is pretty decent for what it is. Mount Vernon can admittedly be a little challenging to get to. It's pretty far past where DC Metro ends. You could potentially take the yellow line to the last station, Huntington, and then pick up a Fairfax County public bus to go the rest of the way. This is kind of slow and not the easiest to do if you're not an experienced public transportation rider. I think most tourists find a hybrid solution of taking the metro to Huntington and then a cab or Uber the rest of the way is the best compromise between cost and convenience. I don't think many people know about this, but there's also a Mount Vernon cruise that you can take from the wharf in DC. It departs from the wharf at 8.30 a.m., takes an hour and a half to get to Mount Vernon, then returns at 1.30 p.m. It's operated by City Experiences and does not operate every day or every month of the year, so make sure to check the operating schedule when you're planning your trip. The best way to make sure you're booking the right one is to start on the official mountvernon.org website and then click through to the cruise website. The cruise includes admission to Mount Vernon, but to me, the biggest disadvantage of the cruise is that you only get about three hours at the estate, which for many people isn't enough. That said, for other people, the draw might be spending three hours on a boat, and for them, the time at Mount Vernon is just kind of a bonus. Okay, now moving out of Virginia, because the third day trip I like and recommend is Baltimore. I like Baltimore because it's close to D.C., it's easy to get to from D.C., and it's a big city with big city attractions 
but not such a big city that one day isn't enough time. Baltimore is often overshadowed because it's wedged between Philadelphia and Washington, D.C., both bigger cities that draw a lot more tourists. But in many ways, that's what makes it worth visiting. It doesn't have the sometimes overwhelming crowds that you will find in places like D.C. and Philadelphia. Plus, it has some things that D.C. simply does not have. For example, Baltimore is known for the National Aquarium, a huge and really nice aquarium right on the Inner Harbor. D.C. has a lot of museums and a zoo, but we do not have an aquarium. Baltimore also has places like the American Visionary Arts Museum, and even though, yes, we have art museums in D.C., this one is unique. It's very Baltimore. I don't know any other way to describe it other than if you're into funky art, this is your place. Baltimore also has plenty of historical sites. There's the Flag House, where Mary Young Pickersgill sewed the actual Star-Spangled Banner. There's Fort McHenry, where that actual flag actually flew as the Americans fended off the Brits during an attack in 1814. There's also the Edgar Allan Poe House and the B&O Railroad Museum. These are not museums that are as big or as famous as the Smithsonian Museums in D.C., but they're cool, and they're unique, and you can find them in Baltimore and not D.C. Logistically, the best way for tourists to do a day trip to Baltimore is by train. There are three train options from Union Station in D.C. There's Amtrak, there's the Mark Penn Line, and there's the Mark Camden Line. Mark, M-A-R-C, stands for Maryland Area Regional Commuter, and it's a commuter train. Amtrak which hopefully you've heard of before, is a longer distance train and both Baltimore and D.C. are on what's called the Northeast Corridor. Any of these trains will get you between D.C. and Baltimore. But the biggest difference is where it drops you in Baltimore. Amtrak and the Mark Penn Line will drop you at Baltimore Penn Station, which is about two miles north of Baltimore's Inner Harbor, the main tourist area. The Mark Camden line will drop you at Camden Station, which is right next to Camden Yards, where the Orioles play and next to the Inner Harbor. So why even consider the others if the Camden line drops you in the best spot? Because unfortunately, the Camden line only runs on weekdays during rush hour, whereas the other two trains run seven days per week at all hours of the day. Amtrak and the Penn line are both perfectly fine you will just need to account for transportation from Penn Station to wherever in Baltimore you want to go, as there aren't really many tourist sites right near Penn Station. Mark tickets can be purchased at machines at the train station. It's really easy. Just go up to the machine and follow the prompts. For Amtrak, I highly recommend downloading the Amtrak app and buying your tickets there. There is always a small chance that Amtrak trains sell out and there are no tickets left which is why I like using the app to guarantee I have a ticket before leaving for the station. Another potential day trip in Maryland, number four, is Annapolis. I feel like Baltimore and Annapolis are opposites in many ways. Baltimore has a reputation of being a bit gritty, blue collar, whereas Annapolis has a reputation of being more of an old money, country club kind of town. While I think stereotypes are usually over-exaggerated, there is a tiny bit of truth in comparing them this way. Annapolis is the capital of Maryland. It's where the governor lives. It's where the legislature meets. Maryland has a stunningly beautiful capitol building. I know some people like visiting all the state capitals, and if visiting capitol buildings is something you're interested in, I think you will be very impressed by what Maryland has to offer. When folks who come on my tour mention they're going to Annapolis, it's usually because they have a teenager who's considering attending the U.S. Naval Academy, which is located in Annapolis. I personally always think of Annapolis as a summer destination. It's on the Chesapeake Bay. You can eat crab legs and crab cakes and all the Maryland delicacies. If you really want to go all out, you can try to find one of those boats that lets you go out and catch your own, though I am personally perfectly fine letting someone else catch the crab and just enjoying it. A little tip when you go to Maryland is that the best seafood restaurants are not the ones with white plates and silverware. They're the ones where they cover the table in newspaper and serve the crab in buckets. If you can find a place like that, you will eat well.
Annapolis has a very cute main street with brick sidewalks and little boutique shops and places where you can stop for coffee and ice cream. It's very picturesque. It's also nearby some nice state parks where you can go for a little hike or a walk on some sand. Just don't expect a full-blown beach experience because you'll probably wind up disappointed if that's what you're looking for. Unfortunately, Annapolis is not particularly convenient to get to from D.C. It's about 40 miles away, which is not far mile-wise, but you more or less need to drive to get there. I generally do not recommend Washington, D.C. tourists drive or get a rental car, but if you already have one for whatever reason and you've always wanted to go to Annapolis, this is your chance. Leaving Maryland now, the fifth potential day trip I like and recommend is Gettysburg. Gettysburg is in Pennsylvania, and if you've heard of it, it's probably because you know the Gettysburg Address, the famous Civil War speech given by Abe Lincoln in 1863. If you're a big history buff, specifically Civil War history, then Gettysburg is probably already on your radar. The good news is it can be done as a day trip from D.C., Gettysburg National Military Park is the official name of the site and is operated by the National Park Service. Within that, there's the museum, the visitor center, the battlefield itself, the David Wills House, and the Eisenhower National Historic Site. I highly recommend spending some time on the official nps.gov website before your day trip, which I will link to in the show notes. There's a lot of useful information there, and you can see maps, logistics, and an event calendar, which I also highly recommend checking out to see if there are any ranger talks or special programming happening on the date you plan to visit. Gettysburg is free, and it's open daily from 30 minutes before sunrise to 30 minutes after sunset. So if you're visiting in the summer, you have a bigger window than if you're visiting in the winter. It's also weather permitting, so if the weather is bad on a particular day, there is a chance they could close down early. Gettysburg has licensed tour guides that you can hire to take you around the park. If you know me, you know I'm a huge fan of guided tours, and I think this is honestly the best way to experience the site if you've never been here before. Gettysburg is huge and can be overwhelming, especially if you're trying to DIY everything. Gettysburg is about 80 miles north of D.C. and takes at least an hour and a half to drive there, depending on traffic. Unfortunately, driving is really the only way to go. In the before times, there used to be a company that ran a bus from D.C. up to Gettysburg and back, and I thought that was a great option because it included both transportation and a tour guide. But unfortunately, it seems that was one of many COVID casualties. Even though this is an episode about day trips from D.C., I actually think Gettysburg is a great stop if you're on a road trip, either before you get to D.C. or after you leave. In fact, a lot of people I meet on my own tours usually do it this way. The sixth potential day trip I like and recommend is a national park, Shenandoah National Park. Shenandoah is not the largest or most famous national park in the system, but it is the closest to D.C. and, in my opinion, still really cool. The purpose of the park is to protect the natural and cultural resources of the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia. It's a long and narrow park with one main road, Skyline Drive, running right through the middle. Shenandoah is part of eight Virginia counties, and from one end to the other is a little over 100 miles long. So even though you can come to the park as a day trip, you cannot see and do everything in the park in a single day. As far as what's to do, there are most of the standard national park things to do. There's hiking, there's scenic overlooks, there's ranger-led history talks and nature talks, there's fishing and camping and little museum exhibits scattered around the different visitor centers. Logistically, most visitors day tripping from D.C. will enter Shenandoah through the Front Royale entrance, which is the northernmost part of the park. To this entrance, it's about a 75-mile trip, and for most day trippers, you're going to have to drive. Unfortunately, Shenandoah is not free to visit. A standard pass is good for one carload of visitors and costs $30. It is valid for seven days starting on the day that you buy it, though if you're just coming here on a day trip, obviously you won't really be able to take advantage of that. 
if you already have the National Park Service annual pass or the America the Beautiful pass, you can use those here. Like Gettysburg, this is another one that might be good not just as a day trip, but as a stop before or after D.C. if you're road tripping. And the seventh potential day trip I like and recommend from D.C. is Charlottesville. Charlottesville is more or less a college town. It's where the University of Virginia campus is located. I personally like small cities like Charlottesville because it feels like they have a lot of big city amenities like hip restaurants and coffee shops, art museums, etc., without the hustle and bustle of a big city. However, the reason most people go to Charlottesville isn't for hip restaurants. It's to visit Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. Monticello is similar to Mount Vernon in that they are both the historic estates of founding fathers and former presidents. Confusingly, they also both start with M. Both are privately owned and operated, so you will need to buy tickets. But if you're into this period of history, the Founding Fathers, or Thomas Jefferson specifically, I think this can be a great day trip. It's also usually less crowded than Mount Vernon, by virtue of being out in Charlottesville rather than closer to D.C. I know many of the guests who come on my tour tell me that Mount Vernon is included on their trip itinerary, but only the biggest of history buffs usually also include Monticello. I think the Monticello website is one of the best and most comprehensive I have seen and definitely worth spending some time reading through to plan out your trip. I especially like that they have some suggested itineraries, including a half-day itinerary, full day, half-day with kids, and a short-on-time itinerary. So no matter how much time you're planning to spend, you can maximize that amount of time. Charlottesville is about 120 miles from D.C., You can drive this, but it's also a day trip that you can potentially do by train. At the time I'm recording this, Amtrak runs two Northeast Regional trains per day in each direction. So if you time it right, you can take the morning train that arrives in Charlottesville around 1040 a.m. and then catch the return train back to D.C. that departs Charlottesville at 7 p.m. The train ride is about two and a half hours long, but it is much more relaxing than driving. It's personally how I would choose to go. Okay, so we've covered all the potential day trips that I like, but I also promised I would tell you some of the day trips that I think are tempting, but that I don't particularly like. Let's take a one minute break so I can run and refill my iced coffee, and then we'll get into that. If you're listening to this podcast, my hunch is that you're probably planning an upcoming trip to Washington, D.C., or at least dreaming about a future adventure. One thing I've learned from meeting thousands of travelers and doing a bit of traveling myself over the years is that experiences are usually the best memories from a trip. That's why I started Trip Hacks D.C. I didn't just want to create content to help you plan a trip, but also to provide an amazing experience once you arrive. And I think it's worked because people tell me all the time that their Trip Hacks DC tour was the highlight of their trip, and that really makes me happy. So if that's something that sounds up your alley, you can head over to TripHacksDC.com to learn about taking a private tour with me or a public group tour with one of the amazing Trip Hacks DC tour guides. And we're back. The first day trip that's going to tempt you but that you shouldn't do is New York City. Let me start by saying that I love visiting New York City. I visit New York City every year. But this is an episode about day trips, and I think New York City makes a terrible day trip from D.C. for the primary reason that it's way too big and overwhelming to try to experience in a single day. That's going to be the theme of the day trips that I don't recommend. They're places that are either too big, too far, or some combination of both. New York City is a combination of both. I get the temptation, though. You're poking around the Amtrak website. You see that you can catch a morning train up and in three and a half hours be exploring Midtown Manhattan by 10 a.m. Then you can catch the 8 p.m. train back to D.C. and get in right before midnight. I'm not saying that this is logistically not possible. It's a very doable train ride. But I ask, once you arrive in Manhattan at 10 a.m., What's your plan for the day? Once you start making that list of things you want to do in New York City, 
you'll probably realize that things are spread out all over the city, and it's going to be very difficult to cram them all in. New York City is quite literally the biggest city in America. It's an amazing destination for a tourist because of the quality and variety of things to do. Last year, I went to New York City for three nights, and I didn't even come close to doing everything I wanted to do. The year before that, I also stayed for three nights. Later this year, I'm planning to go and stay for four nights, and I know that no matter what, when I leave New York City, I will still have a list of things to save for next time. The other thing is that even though it's possible to day trip to New York City on the Amtrak train, it's not necessarily a cheap day trip. If you book far in advance, like I usually do, you can often find fares that are around $100 round trip. But if you wait until closer to the departure, that amount can and will go up. Demand on this route is high and prices reflect that. So even in a best case scenario, say you have a family of four, Is it worth $400 and 7 hours of your day on a train for 10 hours of exploring in in New York City? I personally think the time, money, and energy is best spent on D.C. and planning a separate, proper overnight trip to New York City. Now, perhaps one exception to all of this is that if there is something extremely specific that you want to do in New York City, for example, last year, Phantom of the Opera closed on Broadway after a multi-decade run. I met people who said it was really important to them that they see Phantom one last time on Broadway before it closes, and so they day-tripped up to New York City to do that. I think the key difference is that that was a day-trip for a very specific purpose, to see one show, not to try to, quote-unquote, see New York City. The second day-trip that's going to tempt you but that you shouldn't do is Philadelphia. And the reasons are almost entirely the same as what I just went through with New York City. The thing about Philadelphia is that it is a much bigger city than I think a lot of people give it credit for. The Philadelphia metro area is roughly the size of the Washington DC metro area. It's big. I think part of the issue is that it gets overshadowed by New York and yes, by comparison, it is smaller. I think a lot of people also think of Philadelphia as just the historic sites like the Liberty Bell and Independence Hall and maybe some of the museums nearby. They think they can pop up from D.C. on the train, see those few things, and come back, and they've seen it all. And to be clear, you can do this, and if that's all you care about, then this is possible. But I think when you start researching a trip to Philadelphia, you will realize it has way more to see and do than just those few very famous historic sites, and that one day really isn't enough. An Amtrak train can get you from D.C. to Philly in about two hours. So that's four hours round trip. I've been to Philadelphia many times. I actually think it's a great place to go as a tourist. In addition to the historic sites, Philadelphia has a unique culture that's quite different from what we have here in D.C., and I like experiencing that. So yes, go to Philadelphia, but again, make it a proper overnight trip and not one that's just tacked on to something else. The third day trip that's going to tempt you, but that you shouldn't do, is Williamsburg. I think this one might be a little bit controversial because, unlike New York and Philly, Williamsburg is not a big city. Most people heading there are going specifically for Colonial Williamsburg. This is essentially a big outdoor museum that recreates part of a historic district in the city of Williamsburg from the colonial period of U.S. history. I actually quite like Williamsburg. As a history buff, I think it's a really cool place. Yes, it has a lot of things for kids, but even as an adult, I think it's really cool. And as someone who lives in D.C., getting to visit a small city that's a break from the hustle and bustle can be nice too. That said, when I go, it's always for at least one night, ideally two. Williamsburg is just a bit too far for me to be able to say that it's good to do as a day trip. Williamsburg is about 150 miles south of DC, and in a best case scenario, you could make the drive in about two hours and 45 minutes. The problem is that traffic on I-95 between D.C. and Richmond is notoriously unpredictable. Two hours and 45 minutes is the best case scenario, but if you get unlucky, that number could be much larger. 
And if you're in traffic, it's not just the driving, it's the stress. That's why when I go to Williamsburg, I always take the Amtrak train. The Williamsburg train station is extremely close to the colonial sites and just really convenient. Unfortunately, the train times just don't line up well to do this as a day trip. The train takes about three and a half hours, and if you catch the one that leaves DC at 7 a.m., you'll get in around 10.30. But then the train back leaves Williamsburg at 4 p.m., and I just don't think that's enough time down there to really make it worth your while. And the fourth day trip that might tempt you, but that you shouldn't do is the beach. Not necessarily any specific beach, just the beach. I personally do not think of Washington, D.C. as a beach destination by any stretch of the imagination. But people do ask me about this sometimes. Usually, it's people who live in a landlocked part of the country. They know that Washington, D.C. is a, quote, east coast city, and thus, the Atlantic Ocean can't be that far away. From Washington, D.C., there are three main beaches that people travel to. Rehoboth Beach in Delaware, Ocean City Beach in Maryland, and Virginia Beach, obviously, in Virginia. Off the bat, Virginia Beach is way too far to make this worthwhile as a day trip. It's another 60 miles south of Williamsburg, and traffic not just on I-95 between D.C. and Richmond, but traffic all over the Hamptons Road area is notoriously bad. The amount of time you'll spend in the car, not to mention the stress of driving, just isn't worth it for a single day. Rehoboth and Ocean City actually aren't that close to D.C. either. Both of them are on the Delmarva Peninsula, which, if you're not familiar with the geography, is a peninsula that includes portions of Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. It's actually kind of a cool geographic place, but in order to get to the Atlantic Ocean, you have to cross the Chesapeake Bay and then drive all the way to the other side of the peninsula. Since there aren't really direct interstate routes to these beaches, the drive winds up being about three hours each way, and unfortunately driving is really the only way to go. I totally understand the desire to want to vacation at the beach. I think there are some really nice Atlantic Ocean beaches. They just tend to be a bit more south, in places like North Carolina, South Carolina, and Florida. I just don't think the beaches around here are good enough to justify so much time in the car for a relatively short amount of time on the sand. So hopefully I've given you some ideas of day trips you might want to take when you visit D.C., or maybe I've talked you out of the idea of taking day trips, and that's okay too. Don't feel like you have to take day trips just because you can. Do it because you want to. And before I head out, let's do my end-of-episode Washington, D.C. tourism update. If this is your first time listening to one of these, a few episodes back, I started doing these updates to let you know about what's going on in the city and with Trip Hacks DC. It's been a surprisingly busy May. Usually, May is kind of a quiet month for me, as families either finish their spring break trips or are waiting until the school year ends to start their summer trips. Believe it or not, I wound up doing more tours in May this year than I did in April, which is typically my busiest month. Maybe that was just a bit of a quirk rather than a trend, but I found it interesting. A big part of the reason, though, is because of Memorial Day weekend. Memorial Day weekend wound up being extremely busy. Depending on which stats you believe, this Memorial Day weekend was one of the busiest travel weekends ever, not just here, but all over the U.S. Based on that, I expect 4th of July to be extremely busy in D.C. this year as well. This year, the 4th of July falls on a Thursday, which I think means there are going to be people who come the weekend before, the week of, and the weekend after. As far as Trip Hacks DC tours, the semi-private tour with me returns today on the day this episode goes live. I put eight semi-private tours on the summer calendar, starting today and the next seven Saturdays. So far, none of them are sold out. There are still lots of tickets available, and I'm starting to second guess whether it was a good decision for me to bring back this tour after a successful trial run in the spring. So if you've had your eye on this tour, please go ahead and book it, because if it doesn't perform this summer, then it's unlikely I'll ever bring it back. I've tested several ticket-based tours like this over the years, and unfortunately, they just never seem to have the same interest as my private tours. 
I can't exactly figure out why, but I know private tours work and that people enjoy them, so it just makes sense for me to do what works and what people like. The Monumental Trivia Tour with Christine is also on the calendar and bookable through the end of August. For whatever reason, that tour has been absolutely getting wrecked by cancellations this season. I know cancellations are just part of the business, but it's getting to the point where I have to start questioning whether I need to reconsider this tour entirely. Maybe it's just been a string of bad luck and things will stabilize, but yeah, it's been weird. A lot of cancellations and it is not good for business. We are also in the height of 8th grade field trip season, which I swear feels even bigger and more overwhelming than in the past. There are still several more weeks to go, so if you're coming in early to mid-June, expect big crowds of teenagers everywhere you go. And now that we're in June, it's more or less peak tourism season here, so whatever you plan to do, find out if you need tickets, bookings, or reservations, and get them as soon as possible, because I expect a lot of things will book up, and I hate when people tell me they missed out on something they wanted to do because they waited too long. And if you're still listening and made it this far, thanks for being a TripHex DC superfan. I'm really hoping to get a few new videos published this month, and I'll be back in July for another podcast episode. Enjoy your trip! Thanks for listening to the Trip Hacks DC podcast. To see the show notes from today's episode, get additional resources for planning your trip, or to book a Trip Hacks DC guided tour, visit triphacksdc.com.